Hello everybody, welcome back to the joy of dwarven painting. Today we're back in the forest and we're painting some autumn trees. We've gotten some questions about painting other seasons, so I decided to design a fall scheme for you to follow along and paint. But this is kind of a, a double video because if you compare it to the other forest scheme, you can see how the steps are organized. I'll kind of talk about why the steps are designed the way they are so that you can take that and design your own custom paint schemes as well. So we're going to start with the leaf canopies, my favorite part of a fall scheme, the most colorful part. And first step is very simple. We're taking one of my favorite colors and doing a very heavy dry brush, almost a base coat of deep lava. Use it a lot in hell scheme, but today it's going on trees. So if you're new to dry brushing, you just take a load of paint and you're going to wipe most of it off on a paper towel so it kind of gets a scratchy texture because you want it just hitting the upper texture. But for this first step, it's just fine if it's pretty heavy. I'm being pretty sloppy. It's almost wet paint as well. It's not necessarily even a dry brush because we want to get this almost everywhere. So there are going to be other dry brush steps on top of this. So I am letting this get into the larger recess gaps because most of this is going to be covered up. But acrylic paint is pretty transparent, so it is going to influence the other colors, even though it's mostly covered up with paint. It's going to affect how well the brighter colors go on your Dwarvenite. After going through so many of your painting videos, I was like, I need to paint something. Yes. So I took apart some some furniture we had lying around that looked like crap and then yeah. I made a little thing for the bathroom and I painted it white but I don't have like nice furniture paints right. I mean aside from the white paint and so I tried using acrylic paint to like <laughs> to paint it on this um furniture and yeah it looked really bad because the furniture was already finished <laughs> I ended up like I got to a point where I'm like you know I'm just gonna like sponge it and it's gonna look really cool and artistic right and then um Fran was immediately like, what's the thing oh. where you're afraid of holes, like tryptophobia? Oh God. <laughs> yeah. She's like, it looks like rotten meat. It really scares me. Oh my God. Like, oh, okay. So I repainted it white. <laughs> I was like, no artistic flair today. <laughs> well, uh, if that's any consolation, I've been r repulsed by miniatures I've painted in the past as well. Oh, like which one? I want to know. Just <laughs> anything from high school. <laughs> Not even because of a, an, an effect, just I was like, the uh, the discrepancy between what's in my brain and what happens in front of me <laughs> by my own hand. Is, uh... But actually, I will say the, the gibbering mouth are pretty creepy, pretty scary. Oh yeah, I remember when we were doing reliquaries because you were obsessed with like kind of horror stuff. Yeah. Were you watching lore then or something? Or was, maybe I made that up, but it was like listening to scary podcasts and stuff. Oh yes, yes, yes. Part of that I think was just uh, the pandemic and being inside where uh, I've gotten into more horror movies and spicy foods just to feel something. <laughs> uh, was not previously my thing, but now when I need a little injection of adrenaline. <laughs> wings and horror, baby. <laughs> yeah, you should get really bad wings too. And then <laughs> yeah. Up it. Also never forget like the pandemic Christmas where we both are just like, what if we just watched Evangelion? Yeah. And <laughs> it was like, it's, it's like really sad and gonna make me cry. I was like, I think I need that. Yeah, it's just like, I know I've been like in an existential like stupor for the last week <laughs> after watching it. And you're like, cool, I'm going to start it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are, dude. I need that. I need I a stupor. Feel, let me feel even worse. Yeah. And so you can basically apply this to any of the trees. Like, you're doing, like, the original Dread Hollow trees. But you can put this on any canopy, like, tree, and it'll make sense, right? Yeah, anytime there's a kind of a leafy canopy you can add these same steps. Stuff like the pines. I mean, we've all seen pine trees in the fall, right? They don't change a whole lot. So I think if you just follow the, the original factory scheme for that, it'll add variety. I think that's actually the most fun part about this scheme. And the thing that sells it as the fall is the slight variations between all the changing leaves. So I only have one tree, but we're actually gonna do three different colors on the same canopy. And we'll see it in the final shot rotating, but you can, uh, basically pick out maybe triads or couples of canopies with a topper to be 
different versions of changing leaves so that when you put them in a build, they're kind of scattered in a, in a variety sampler. Yeah, maybe you throw more yellow into one tree. and Right, right. Yeah. But it all starts uh, with the same step. By design. So that's kind of a tip too, is how can you layer the steps? You organize the outline kind of from top to bottom. So we're starting with a color that's going to support any one of these variations. So are you starting with the darkest tone or are you starting with like a mid-tone that you're planning to use? Yeah, this is going to be one of the darkest tones. We're going to kind of get into some some of that golden look and the ochre. Um, and if you do do kind of a lighter dry brush and leave some of the darker casting color behind, I think this by itself could also be a really cool variation as well. I'm going to hit it with something lighter just to catch more of the texture. But you, like I said, you can adjust all these steps yourself. So if you kind of like this rusty red color that I think works great for fall, you can mix up your own slightly darker highlight just to texturize the canopy, but have this be one of your main colors. I think it's also one fun thing about doing experiments with fall too is you don't even necessarily need to wipe off or like repaint a thing if it wasn't exactly the color you expected because having that variation, having one come out a bit lighter or darker than you expected, but then having it be like a middle canopy or something um, could be really interesting. Right, because the leaves are changing, right? So different kind of bundles could be at a different stage of uh, drying out and whatnot. So the next color we're gonna dry brush right on top of this step is terracotta dry brush, kind of a yellow brown ochery. And that'll kind of be the, the middle ground. We kind of have our, our rusty, dark autumn color. This is sort of the mid-tone. And spoiler, last one, we're going on the magic school bus. So this is kind of in between our, our, our fall selection. The Picorni Fall Collection. <laughs> yeah. So same dry brush technique. Now the paints do come out a little thin, so it may take a couple of dry brush swipes to get the bristles with enough paint to make it opaque. And you're probably going to have to go over this a few times because it is still a fairly dark color uh, but like we said you can do one two dry brush steps make it really faint kind of like this here and this will dry even not even as bright um, but maybe you go three four get it really opaque and that will give you even more variation so you're almost mixing by using transparent or lighter and heavy dry brushes to make different colors different results You want to let your layers dry in between. I'm going a little faster so you can see it kind of pools in some of the detail. Just because I'm just trying to get the opacity really fast. But the more you let it dry and the, the more light layers you add, the finer the, the texture will be. So that's kind of the balance as you're going through a lot of pieces is hitting that, that middle ground between a neat result, but still efficiency in painting large batch pieces. I'm leaning more on the uh, side of abandon here as I slop this paint around, but we'll still uh, see the effect reasonably well. Now I said we're doing uh, three different colors on this canopy, but I kind of did half of it in this step because again, the two steps support our school bus steps. So we're going to do it right on top of this one. So this is where you can kind of separate your pieces as you're going, you can decide Oh, this one I'm going to do steps one and two. This step I'm going to just do step one. This one I'll do all three steps to get that variation. So you can kind of be spontaneous with it as you're going through a large number of pieces. And I think it makes it kind of exciting as you, uh, you know, sit down for your painting session to paint a large number of pieces. Is this sort of a paint scheme that you picked up from being on Hamster's Hobby Hang? Because I know like Amy does a whole bunch of fall colors with forest pieces and stuff. You know, I haven't seen. I could be making that up her too, stuff as sure. well. She's done fall stuff. <laughs> um, in fact, I should go back and look at that. 
because I'm interested in how you know someone else interpreted a scheme to get a similar result. So that'd be that'd be really neat. She also did like a fairy forest thing as well. I was just thinking, what if it was like a bunch of pink and purple trees? That'd be so much fun. Yeah. I've seen a couple. The the forest, I, I think wilderness, just because we see things change so much in nature, like just lends itself to so many creative paint schemes. Like for some reason, it's just it's easier to buy like, oh yeah, everything here is pinks and purples and uh, and stuff like that than in a dungeon or a cavern. There is actually a document that the uh, people on Discord put together of custom paint schemes that uh, community members have designed. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. I want to so, see that. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a couple for forests. I think there was one for slime caverns. Slime caverns? One for sandstone. I'm trying to remember like what they all were, but yeah, there's a there's a variety. We have, we have a lot of uh, really talented painters in there that design they did like they turned um burrows into like monster belly <laughs> that's wow. cool yeah in the belly of the whale <laughs> yeah so our next leaf variation we're going even brighter the nice golden yellow with pokorny school bus We're gonna go right over this entire section as if you know we're doing the whole canopy in this variation. But that's how you can apply this step to as many canopies as you want and leave some in other versions of our fall colors. I'm gonna do this one a little lighter. So this is my test one. They went pretty heavy on here and covered a lot of it up and made it reasonably opaque. But I think there could also be a cool thing where you leave it a little patchy maybe and you have some of the previous steps showing through to show even more variation with the same amount of effort. Spoiler on the, the highlight on the deep lava there. So as you can see, this step is a lot faster than the previous ones that are more foundational. And so you can pick and choose when you deploy this step because really it's just a matter of seconds to get a nice golden effect on it. So as you're going through your batch, you can, again, pick and choose which steps you're utilizing. And as you're going through the batch and you're applying your paint, it does appear brighter when it's wet. So make sure to, to go back and take a glance at the pieces you previously painted. You can decide if you want to do another pass of the, the last step and so on to get the opacity and the effect that you want. So for our first steps, we prepared a few different colors. But remember, nature has a ton of different variation. So when I wanted to make a highlight for this color, I went a little crazy and just took what's already on my palette and mixed them together. This is deep lava, this is school bus. And it turned into a little more of a highlight, but it made a really cool variation. So again, as you're going through these steps, I encourage you to try mixing. Mixing will, will open up your imagination and be more spontaneous as a painter. I know it can be intimidating, but you have your colors all laid out. You got nothing to lose because it's all kind of earthy tones. They're all gonna work in a fall scheme. So for a true highlight of the deep lava, I might not go quite as orange, but I, I still love the results. So you can have a lot of cool discoveries when you're painting this way a little more spontaneously. And as you saw here, the ratios aren't exact and they don't have to be. You know, if, if I were to give you a ratio, I'd probably just say one to one, just to be safe, because that would give you a, a similar mixture. But you don't always need numbers. Sometimes you just want to go with the flow and uh, sort of trust your taste as you're, you're looking at your mixes. So now we're moving on to some forest floors 
And when I was looking at pictures of landscapes, which I also encourage you to use references, it can help inform your decisions when designing a scheme quite a bit. But in the time of fall when the leaves are changing, how we're painting them here, there's still a lot of green among the grass and the, the ground. So we're actually starting with the same first step as the regular forest scheme, which is a dry brush, heavy dry brush of shallow water green. So as we mentioned in our other Wildlands painting videos, don't be too neat with this step. It's okay to be a little sloppy. All the next steps will cover up any mistake areas, but you have a lot of ground to cover. So you kind of just want to get this one done with. Yeah, six by six inches of it. <laughs> exactly, literally a lot of ground. So I'll try to avoid the rocks and such, but I'm not worrying about it. I would rather get some on the rocks while hitting the moss that I need to hit here then be too careful about not hitting stuff. Some of this I am gonna do less dry brushing and more wet paint base coating just to make sure there's a nice layer of green underneath. Cause again, it's gonna dry much darker. So we kind of just wanna leave a little bit of green behind cause we're gonna sort of dry it up and fall it up. So we want it to be in some of the recesses. It'll mostly be a hint by the time it's dry. It won't be quite this bright. So in the original forest scheme, the next step would be a moss green, really bright, really healthy looking. We're gonna do the same technique in a dry brush over our shallow water green, but we're gonna use olive dry brush. So it's a little more desaturated. It's kind of grayer, less colorful. So it's gonna make it have that more dried out look, but still have a bit of that greenness underneath that I wanna keep a touch of. While it's wet, if you make a mistake, it's easy enough to just use your finger to wipe it off. Sometimes a damp brush will wick it away as well. I did consider, I think I brought it, I did consider using sludge as well, because as you can see, it's not quite as bright as moss green, but I think it falls into even more of the early fall. It's still more green than the olive, but I decided to, to go with the olive just to sort of dehydrate that grass a little bit more. But you can look in your collection at all your earth tones. There's quite a number of them in the Picorni range and uh, decide for yourself as you go through the steps. And I am also gonna use the olive dry brush to hit the rocks as well. So part of designing a scheme is thinking about efficiency, right? Anytime you add colors, it adds a step. So in the original scheme, the dry brush was earth stone. And olive dry brush and earth stone aren't terribly different from each other. So since I already have it on my palette, I'm just utilizing that color for the same step. Now you may notice, I also didn't begin the rocks with a dry brush of base gray. Again, an extra color, an extra step across your whole batch. But I did a test piece right here, actually. And I kind of liked how the rocks were going to do that final step, which is a cavernous dry brush. We'll show you that in a minute. But I like how it sort of has a different look, uh, a different kind of ambiance than the, the other forest floors. And it still looks like rock. So we're just going to completely skip that gray. You can leave more or less gray behind, or maybe do some thicker patches. I'll do an extra pass just on certain sections, because variation is key. And it's fun. So next we're going to hit the wood, and again, use the same First step for the wood as the other forest floors, which is a base wood. The trunks of trees and such don't, uh, don't change too much in the fall, do they? So we're mostly gonna do the same thing with a slight adjustment.
So while we have our base wood paint out for the wood floors, we're going to go back and paint the trunks of the canopies. And this is one way you can increase your efficiency when you're batch painting. When we finished up the leaves, it might be tempting to say, hey, I'm going to finish up the trunks so these pieces are done. But we know that we're going to base wood later on the floors. So while I have it out here being used elsewhere, I'm just going to quickly hit each one of these. So we knew we were going to use it in a later step, after a, a couple first steps on the forest floor, so we can save the canopy trunks for when we're using the same paint elsewhere. can't believe you didn't take the opportunity to make this a white bark tree. A white bark? Yeah, yeah. it could have drastically changed what the wood looks like. A birch tree. Yeah, make it a birch. But it's not a birch. It's not the papery bark. You think people at home know that? <laughs> We're in the business of using our imaginations, right? I'm sorry, in my fantasy world. <laughs> so now we're gonna add some of those fall colors to the forest floor. And we're gonna utilize the paints that we've already used for the canopy. So we've already have them out uh, for previous steps. So we're just gonna utilize them again here for extra steps. So that's a big part of how I design a scheme is deciding the impact of each color and trying to limit the number of colors while still having maximum impact. Um, and I love having them out on the palette pretty much at all times. Um, I know you, you wanna conserve your paint a little bit, but having just a dab out of all colors, you can always go back and forth between the steps so here I, I missed some of the olive on the rocks. It's right there on the palette. I can do it real fast instead of realizing it later. I mean, like, oh no, you get out your paint. So I kind of just have all my paint ready to go at the same time. This kind of interesting, another opportunity for variation. I just got done painting the base wood. I didn't rinse my brush, put it right in the olive. Now we have an even different color for some of this underneath. While we're doing a wilderness scheme, I'm just gonna touch it random places for variation. So a scheme doesn't have to be set in stone, especially when it's your own custom batch. I just had a happy accident here in my mix. I'm just going to utilize it here and there. So why not? I use it for this kind of mud patch here. How about that? Why not? We're going crazy. We're going freaking bonkers over here. I know like this thing was initially pitched as trying to be like very calm and Bob Rossi, but what if we delivered these painting videos in the style of the Old Spice commercials? <laughs> and just make it really stressful. Yeah. Now back to the scheme, we're going back to the colors that we used for our leaf canopies. We're gonna pick out some of the details to give it that fall flare. We sort of have the, the greenery, the drying out greenery going on, but we're gonna do the same exact steps. Deep lava, and I'm just gonna pick out the leafier details that would dry out It's kind of similarly to the canopies. You don't have to do every single one we're going to grab some of these leaves here, some of these plants with long leaves on them. Basically give them the exact same treatment. So utilizing a smaller amount of colors in many different places also helps it stay cohesive among different pieces. If you throw different colors here and there, it can be cool, but I think it, it makes it a little more, each piece is a little more related when you keep the palette together. So I noticed this go around, you're eating your brush a lot less. Oh yeah? You're like, before you, you like would lick the brush and then go back to it? Yeah. Well, um, before shooting the video today, I already had breakfast. Ah, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm full, I'm satisfied. I suppose I do that mostly for controlling the moisture on the brush, but we're doing a lot of the dry brushing stuff, so there's less moisture involved. Which you should not do anyway. You can all, you can just rinse it out and use a paper towel, but it's a habit. Plus, none of these paints are your favorite flavors. Right, so. exactly, exactly. There's no sludge in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really why sludge ended up being your favorite during Wildlands. Yes. I was painting that barge. I was like, yummy, yummy. Sludge may or may not have some psychoactive qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that's not listed on the site, on the description, but... Take it from me. 
If we keep that in, we're going to have to put like a hearty disclaimer at the bottom. Jay's going to freak out. I just thought that. <laughs> disclaimer warning. So while I'm going through this step, I'm kind of taking a, a glance at the piece and looking at the, the separation and kind of allocation of all the different colors. So down here, there's kind of a patch, so I might add a little separation, break it up. So there's a little thought that goes into it, but you really can't go wrong. Just do as much or as little as you'd like here. I did these leaves here since they kind of got hit with the rock dry brush, so I want them to stick out from the rocks. So I'll do that. But this moss and whatnot, I'll probably leave that green. One more glance. Probably just break this up here a little bit and leaving some of the others in the group as is. So again, we're going back to our leaf colors here, except since we are painting a lot more on the floors, just for efficiency, we're only going to do one. We're going to do that sort of mid tone between the three here. And not only for efficiency, but also because the, the stuff that has fallen onto the ground is the most dried out, right? So to me, I think this is the, the most kind of dried out color that we have at our disposal that we've chosen for the scheme. So that's why I'm going to apply it here. Just to keep things simple, since there's a lot more detail on the floors, I'm just going to do the one color. But feel free to, to pick out any of these mixes that we've already used throughout the scheme, especially if some exist on your palette, ready to go, still wet. Might as well throw it on the floor. Throw it on the floor. Bad. You can't say that. I'm pretty sure that's copyrighted. <laughs> Now, when I tested a scheme on a smaller floor, I did most of the plants with this terracotta dry brush highlight. But now that I'm looking at a larger floor, I think you can decide just how much you want to do. I might leave some of these with a little more deep lava or almost all deep lava just for, for more variety. So do this as much or as little as you'd like. You can make some more or less opaque with extra layers here. Get this one extra opaque. So now we need a color to pick out some little accents, spots of color here. So we're going back to the colors that we already used. I'm gonna take the school bus and use that. It falls nicely into the autumn scheme, cohesive related to the canopies because we've used it there as well. And it's already available on the palette. So it's both impactful and efficient. So that's kind of the bullseye. So a yellow snake, you think that's poisonous? It's gotta be. Or maybe it's lemon flavored. Hey, it's worth trying out. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I need a snake. Yep. Yeah, it's basically a worm. <laughs> a spicy worm. They're spicy. just like scaly gummy worms. Yeah, that's why we have gummy worms, to encourage snake eating. It's really wild that they made animals out of gummy worms. It's give, it gives you some ideas, huh? Yeah. I think the Animal Crackers guys like sued nature for making tigers and stuff. I'm like, I have an Animal Cracker and he's giving me ideas to go out there and try some real safari food. You can pick out any details you want here. I'm not necessarily picking out the same ones on each floor. Maybe if there's sort of these bulbous details, I'll pick those out as well. But even on a patch of grass or something, we're looking at it from table view, right? So I'm just going to add a couple flowers where they're not even necessarily sculpted. It's just a patch of some kind of dandelions or weeds or anything. So you can be creative with this step. It doesn't have to be paint exactly this with this step. Just take a glance, just like the other steps here, and look at the separation. What needs a little pop? And you can decide. I missed some leaves here, so I'm just gonna, since this color's on my brush, I'm just gonna blend it right into the previous step. So it kind of look, maybe looks like it's in different phases of transitioning. One side of the plant is drying out a little quicker. It's starting to go to that fully dried out version. But you don't always have to go backwards and, and fix things exactly. Just kind of go with the flow. 
the colors are all related, they're all fall-like, so I'm just going to keep on moving forward, and now I have a cool, fun little effect there. You can see here I missed some of the moss, it doesn't even have some of that shallow water green, but another opportunity for variation. Olive is available on the palette, I'm just going to hit that, and it'll look slightly different than the rest of the floor, it's kind of cool. Now speaking of olive, we haven't highlighted the wood yet, have we? Now, typically the highlight for wood is a mix between the base wood and the stucco. But stucco we don't have on the palette. And how impactful is that really going to be? I don't think it's worth it to pull out a whole new paint. We already have olive on here and we have base wood. So instead of mixing base wood with stucco, we're just going to take some olive. We already know we like olive for kind of how dried out, desaturated it looks. So it's still a lighter highlight color, but not quite as bright as a stucco mix. And even add a little more olive. Now conversely, we are gonna grab a brand new color that's only for this last step, which is highlighting the rocks. We're gonna use Caverns Dry Brush. And again, it's evaluating how impactful it's going to be. So here, I do think it's worth it to add an extra color into the palette. It's gonna give a great value pop, kind of the difference on the piece between light and dark. It'll be one of the brightest spots and really make them look more like rocks amongst the earthy vegetation. So that's why I think it's worth it. We're gonna add it into the palette for this step. Sometimes when I first start dry brushing with the color, I'll actually load the brush and rub it off multiple times just to get enough pigment on the bristles. Sometimes you see me painting it on my hand. It's mostly just so I can feel the level of moisture. So I have a sense of like what the result is gonna be. I kind of know the moisture level that I want. So that's kind of why I'm doing all these weird things, <laughs> painting all over my hands. Those rocks are looking really dehydrated. <laughs> they need a drink of water. They're pretty porous, so uh, the next rain. Yeah, people forget to water their rocks. <laughs> you know? Exactly. How do you expect them to stay alive without watering them every day? Right. Yeah, add, add back in that base gray step if you want your rocks to look like they've been good and watered. And you may have noticed I didn't even clean up some of the sections that got the original shallow water green dry brush on here, especially when we're doing an all over dry brush like this last one here with the caverns step, caverns dry brush. Um, and we leave behind little patches of green here and there. I think that just adds to the look. I don't need to see it as a mistake. I don't need to fix it. We're just putting the step in this place because we know that it will cover some of that up and sort of add to the result. So that's it for Autumn Trees. If you try this out, tag us on your social media photos. We'd love to see them. Join our Discord. Our community loves helping out new painters and helping come up with custom schemes. I heard there's actually a document of everyone's custom schemes that they've added to it. So you can check that out and see how others have designed schemes. Uh, please experiment, get paint bravely. Um, it's a lot of fun. Join me on Hamster's Hobby Hang on Twitch every Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we do, we paint a lot of miniatures and uh, thank you to the video team for another Joy of Dorman painting. Chris, Syl, Casey. Hello. We'll see you next time.